Hi, everyone. First, thank you so much for coming to the Trans Fran Bookstore. I'm actually nervous. I'm never nervous. Um, especially, when I should be nervous because I'm here talking to some of the most outstanding romance authors out there, and we're talking about some very serious stuff, but we're also going to share some fabulous stories about how they wrote the books, why the books are important, and what's this thing all about when we talk about romance and respect. So my computer just went off <laughs> in a timely way. Is there a hashtag or other social media for this panel? Um, very good question. So let's go with romance, romance, respect, hashtag romance, respect. And of course, the Strand Bookstore's tags are at Strand Bookstore at, on both Twitter and Instagram, I believe. Yes, I've been hashtagging away. So these things are in my mind. Thank you for asking. I appreciate it. And then you can also uh, do at Avon Books. It so happens that these authors are um, one of their publicists or publishers is Avon Books. I think all of them here. Um, now, where did romance and respect come from? We know some of the origins of it because it's kind of obvious. But in August of 2017, we were in DC, which is my neck of the woods, and we were at a place called Politics and Prose. And the conversation was very much about how romance writers, romance authors, romance readers sometimes don't get the respect they deserve. And a man by the name of I'm going to get Ron Charles, who is an editor, author, reporter at the Washington Post, wrote an article about it. And it was a fabulous article. So that's why these authors are here today as part of the topic we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to dive right in. And I'm going to start with Joanna at the end. Yes, because you're at the end there. And my first <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Everybody down here is like, yes. Um, so the first question that I'm going to have, I'm going to throw out there is, what's a myth about romance novels and romance authors that you would love to see drop off the edge of a cliff? <laughs> well, I just have to say, everyone else has notes, and I'm feeling very, <laughs> I'm feeling very underprepared at this end of the table. So. Um, I think for me, it's that all the books are the same. I mean, that's, um, I hear very frequently, oh, you write r romance? Oh, all, it's all the same. It's just insert, you know, character A, character B, you know. <laughs> no, that's, we're saving that for later, Megan. That's a late, that is a topic for later. Um, but yeah, that every, every book is the same, that it's the same regenerated plot. Um, you know, oh, I've read one, you've read them all. Um, I think there's so much depth to romance. There's so much um, ingenuity and so much creativity. And uh, I know as a historical author, we research our butts off. And, um, you know, I can say that every book I learn something new. I try to include something new. I try to put in a twist and a turn that I think maybe the reader isn't expecting. I hope, I pray, whatever. Um, so that, for me, it's uh, the cookie cutter, it's all the same. I, I think that's just, that's a myth that's got to go. Yes, oh. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my answer to that would be, oh, you write bodice rippers, which makes me crazy. Um, because for me, that seems as, it's so antiquated. Uh, yes, there were bodice rippers in the, 70s and I guess early 80s. I'm not sure. I know I stopped reading romance around that time because I didn't like what was happening in romance and I ended up reading litfic, whatever. Um, so, <laughs> but if you think about what was happening in the late 70s and 80s, that's as, uh, like people still had cords on their phones. People had, what? we didn't have an internet. We, we, we wore jelly shoes. <laughs> Like, and shoulder pads, yes. We had feathered hair. We didn't realize, like, so saying that, a, that things are a bodice ripper in 2017 or any time in the, in the years 2000 plus or whatever is offensive and ignorant. 
So yay for you for telling me that I write bodice rippers. So actually, in uh, a book, the book I'm working on now, she actually rips his shirt. And I, I was having, I had a, such a fun time writing that. And so, yeah. I'm going to add a question for Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> she was ready. I saw those notes. I saw. <laughs> well, you can still answer this one, but because of uh, Meg's response, um, I also would like you to add to your answer, has the definition of romance or respect changed <laughs> since your career, since you launched your career? So give me a little taste of both. Danny. <laughs> okay, so first I was going to say that Joanna totally looked at my notes because she took my answer. <laughs> and then I had a backup answer and Megan totally took my backup <laughs> answer. And then Denny throws me a curveball. It's like, ah. Um, well, first, I would like to say that I think the myth that I totally hate is the formula formulaic that, you know, it's all the same. It annoys me that they don't say that about any un other genre. I mean, hello, mysteries at the end. We find out who killed the person. <laughs> In thrillers, you know, spoiler alert, there's going to be like a showdown between the hero and the, you know, villain. And the hero usually gets away. So all these other genres, there's a formula to be followed, but we're the only one that gets that thrown at us, so I totally hate that. Um, and then as for change, I think, I think so in some ways. I will say that in my personal interaction, when I used to tell people that I write romance novels, I'd get the, oh, you know, sort of <laughs> look, like the upper lip kind of curls a little and this, you know, waft of condescension sort of like, comes over towards me um, and now I generally get like oh that's really interesting I get questions a lot um, of people are more likely to admit that they read romance novels too if they don't they ask me questions um, which is really nice um, and every once in a while I'll still get a dick who responds the other way around and I just <laughs> I can't I can't help them you know so. I'm not going to switch it up. So same uh, two questions. And uh, the first one had to do with what's that myth that you'd like to see dropped over a cliff? And the second one is just have you noticed a change in uh, romance and respect since the early days of your career? Uh, the myth I'd like to see dropped off the cliff would be the one that romance is a cover for soft porn. <laughs> Wow. And everybody was like, wait, it's not? <laughs> there are two aspects to this. <laughs> One is, okay, what's wrong with soft porn? Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Why? Oh, because women are reading it. Oh, that, that's the thing. But the other is that, again, you've got the same uh, kind of reaction as calling it a bodice ripper, which is to say it's all the same thing. And um, it's all about sex. And as far as I, whether it's, it's got lots of sex in it or very little sex in it, I always thought it was about the relationship. And that's why women are reading the books, is for the relationship and the development of a relationship, a uh, bond between two human beings. Um, and the other, the change in terms of romance and respect, a little. Um, I still brace myself when someone's, when I say I'm a writer, and people say, well, what do you write? And I say, I write historical romance. And inside I'm going, yeah. <laughs> yeah? yeah. Um, but sometimes, but more often now than used to be, they do, actually do, they ask, the questions. Um, oh, really? Um, what's that about? Or um, how long have you been writing? It's a little more respectful than it used to be. Thank you. Tessa, same two questions. OK. Um, well, I agree with all of, of those answers. Those were, um, I, yeah, I had those written, written down in my notes, which are closed. <laughs> ah, so you can't change the answers up on me. Um, yeah, I guess the only myth I would like to see dropped off a cliff would be uh, that we're all like having like wild, wild sex <laughs> in our own personal lives. 
Not that that's not true, <laughs> but it invites a lot of weird questions from men um, about like, where'd you learn all this and how do you do research? Things like that. <laughs> do you guys get that? You guys get that. Um, the definition of respect, uh, in terms of like writing, I don't think it's changed much. I've only been publishing for five years, so um, my editors have always been great about making sure my guys don't take, you know, don't go too far too fast. Don't get, don't do things without getting uh, consent. I think consent is the most important thing that, especially right now, it's like, I, you know, the definition of respect is changing rapidly day by day. Um, consent is really important and it has to be verbal. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's something that, uh, you know, I, I really, I work hard to apply in, our bo in my books and I'm sure that they all do too. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, now I'm going to ask Meg a question. Um, Meg, what's your response when someone asks you when you're going to write a real book? You know, I, I actually, um, so I, I actually haven't come up with, I haven't come across people like that too much because for some reason I live in a, in a wonderful little fairyland where that doesn't happen. <laughs> But, you know, and I would have to, you know, I, when all the snarky stuff comes to mind, but I don't know that I would. And I guess I would ask, just ask them, what do you consider a real book? Like, is a real book a published book? Is it a book that people read? Is it a book that people like and buy and continue to buy? Then, sorry, dude. And it's a dude. I'm just saying. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Uh, it's, it's, you know, real books are, are, if everybody has to die at the end, that's not a real book to me. And you can take that in your classicist ass and shove it. So. <laughs> okay, I, now I have a question for the panel. I'm, I'm going to ask, what changes if any, do you anticipate in the publishing in industry in the future? Now we could have a long list or just pick one that just jumps right to the top of your mind. And I'm not going to start with Joanna. I'm going to start with Tracy. <laughs> yeah, I, I gave it away. I know. Um, I mean, for me, I think diversity um, of characters, of authors, of people in publishing, making the decisions. I think it's clear that readers are asking for it, that there's an audience for it. Um, and so, you know, and there are lots of us writing it. So I think, the, you know, diversity, increasing it in all areas of publishing is the major change that needs to happen. Meg? I would jump in and say exactly the same thing. That's the first thing that, that came to my mind is uh, making sure diversity, and even that sounds a little bit pejorative, like we have to represent, like we have to push that in. But as white authors, well, I'm, I'm speaking as a white author, I have to say that I have to, that I have to think about that because I hadn't had to think about that before because it wasn't, I just wasn't, oh, <laughs> thanks. Um, it's something that's crucially important. It's something, I live in Brooklyn. I walk down my street and I often don't see people that look like me. And yet when I write, I write books, they all look like me. And I need to do better and that's something that I'm totally conscious of and that the publishing world has to do better in. Can I throw that out? Would anybody else like to chime in a response to that question? Joanna? <laughs> I force Goodness. people. Um, yeah, I would jump in on the intersectionality, really, of history. I don't think we do anybody any benefit as a historical author when um, you focus your books through a single lens and, it's, it, and it looks very one-dimensional. Um, history is not one-dimensional. I think we're learning that, you know, as we, um, you know, for me, I feel like I discover new little tidbits and nuggets every time I research something. And uh, we think we know history because we've learned it 
since kindergarten, and especially, you know, I write American history, and that's, that can be a tough hurdle for some people. I've had readers say to me, I won't read anything set in, his, in his, um, American history. I just won't. I want to read the stuff set in England, because I don't know um, their history at all, and it's dukes and earls, and I want to say, well, do you know how the dukes and earls made their money? Because let me tell you, um, it was not pretty. Um, so uh, for me, um, I, th I think just keeping history uh, true to, to really what it, what it was, I think is important. For, that's what I think about going forward. Um, and also, like um, Tessa said, consent. I think readers will not put up with, even if it's set in history, if it's a historical, they will not put up with those blurred lines of consent and you know the a-hole alpha hero who, I mean, that, that, those days just don't exist anymore. So that's also something that I think about. I have a uh, just show of hands. Um, how many folks here have been reading romance under five years? Just one, oh, come on, be brave. <laughs> let, let me see this. So the majority of this audience has, um, you'd say five to 10 years, or get those hands up, I'm just curious. More than 10 years, you babies. Um, okay, so we have a, a, a lot of romance readers here, for a lo in for the long haul. Uh, how many of you who are not currently authors are thinking about writing a book, or are, are hey, let's go, let's put those hands up, okay. <laughs> no, they're pointing, there are people pointing at each other. Okay, I just wanted to get a little take. We're gonna have questions later for the entire panel. I just wanted to get a little take on the audience. I have a question here, and I'm gonna throw this one to Tessa. <laughs> What was, is, the biggest hurdle you faced, and we sort of answered this when introducing romance to someone new to reading the genre, or in other words, what's that elevator pitch? Um, I think, I should probably use my microphone. Um, I think like my elevator pitch is usually, who do you want to be today? Like, you could be anybody you want if you just pick up a romance novel. You can be a baker, you could be an attorney, you could be like, you know, a homeless person. I mean, you can live a world through someone else's eyes for two days and you can pick anyone you want. And like, I don't think there's any other genre that delivers, I mean, that delivers that in such a relatable way that's safe because you're going to get a happily ever after at the end. You can do that, you can explore all these different perspectives in a safe way. And that's what I usually tell people. That's my elevator pitch. Yeah. Anyone else have an elevator pitch when they're asked that question? Loretta? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a ready answer for that, but I, and sometimes when you're talking, it, it depends on who you're talking to, because you know some people may be open to it and other people are not gonna be open to it. Um, but I present the idea that romance is a, a genre fiction, and some people like detective stories, and some people like science fiction, and some people like westerns, um, and romance is, is the one that gives you the happy ending of where love conquers all. Um, and I think if you've been trained the way I was uh, in college, the happy ending is a bad thing. Um, somehow that's not true to whatever. Um, but I think it's a great thing to read. And if my um, enthusiasm comes across, then that's my pitch. I don't have a specific line. Um, when I first started writing, just two seconds on me. Um, I started writing something called fan fiction, and I don't know how many of you folks are familiar. I wrote in the Buffy Spike, that's the only fandom worth the time of day, thank you very much. Uh, one of the challenges though in transitioning from writing fanfic, and, and good fanfic with Buffy and Spike, um, is that your characters are already on the page, your readers already know and love the characters. The question I have for these authors here who write these compelling, uh, what 
we used to call original characters. Um, how do you find that character? What, what, what is it that, that brings that character to life for you when you're in the early stages of looking at your story in that book? Um, Meg nodded, so you, you're, you're going. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, it's so boring. Um, <laughs> I I come up with my characters. I um, just think about so the type of uh, person that would fit the plot, and um, I work backwards from there. Um, I think a lot of us sort of do that, but then what I do to try to make my characters stand out is I give them traits, little small things um, that I pick up from it in real life that my friends may do or that my husband may do. Um, and I mentioned, um, well, there's two things uh, in Love Will Always Remember. The first is um, my husband, when he laughs at something, he has this way of laughing like with his entire body. It's it's really adorable um, and so like if we're sitting there watching TV and something's funny like he laughs and his whole body sort of goes forward and I just love that and so I added that small thing to my character because that just makes it makes him more real it's a small thing but it it, it makes him more three-dimensional than him just being you know tall and gorgeous and a you know, a really great chef, so, you know, as they all are. Um, and then, <laughs> um, and then with my heroine, um, I'm a really good cook, I have to say. I'm, I'm gonna put this out there, but. We're also in a trade show. <laughs> sure, just come to Virginia, no problem. Um, but somehow, with the way my house was constructed, they put the smoke detector really close to the stove, right? And I could cook anything and just a whiff of smoke and that freaking alarm goes off and every, I'm telling you like five times a week I'm over there doing the little dance with the <laughs> towel trying to you know <laughs> just hope my neighbors aren't coming and they're probably like oh that woman sucks she can't cook um, and so I added that little bit to a scene for my for my heroine so um, we have to make characters that you guys want to read that you um, can identify with, but I think adding those small little touches, and I usually just take them from people I know, make them three-dimensional, and give them their own sort of persona. Tessa? So probably like four years ago, I went to my first RT convention in New Orleans, and I've been sitting here trying to remember the author's name. I can't, I can't believe I, I can't think of it, but... Uh, she did a panel and she talked about um, like learning your characters before you start writing your book so that you know them in, inside and out before you even start writing. And she does this exercise where she um, writes uh, a few pages of the worst moment of their life. <laughs> I know. And I started doing that and like once you know how your character reacts or even just knowing what their worst moment was but how they react to it, like you almost know how they're gonna react to everything. Because that worst moment, like it kind of defines, you know, your worst moment defines you, um, and it shapes you, and um, be, it makes your insecurities re like you know more sharper and things like that. Um, so I think that's a really good way that I learn my characters. I don't do it so much when I write like rom coms, but when I write something that's a little bit more um, emotional, I usually write that scene. Does anyone else have an answer to that? I usually learn mine through writing dialogue uh, between the two of them, which is why I usually have to rewrite the beginning of a book like five or six times because the dialogue between them doesn't occur until, you know, chapters three and four. So I usually have to go back and redo the beginning. But that's, that's for me how I really discover who they are. I find that some characters come into my mind fully blown and I understand them inside and out. And that's a wonderful thing that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Other times it's a process of um, very much like what Joanna was talking about, I'm writing the dialogue. And until the dialogue clicks between the hero and the heroine, there's a moment and it could be three words and then I understand them. And then I can continue to write and the characters start to form um, in my mind. It's just not, it's not a consistent process for me. Another thing that fascinates me about 
well-written books, fabulous romances. Yes, the happy ending, but the conflict that makes those stories just jump off the page. How do you find, I need this help here. Um, how do you get to that conflict? What, what process? I asked my husband. <laughs> Um, I just want to give a shout out to Sarah McLean, who's here, who gives a workshop on conflict, which is yes, one of the best Sarah. workshops I've ever sat in. And um, she not only gives great examples um, of, you know, romances that we've all read and why they're so successful, why that conflict is so sharp, but it's basically picking the worst person for the other, you know, taking those two extremes, who's the worst person you could pair with that person, and we're going to make it work. And that, I think, is, is uh, that just leads to so much delicious conflict. I mean, I think along those same lines, in the, in the first rejection scene, uh, which I just saw, Pride and Prejudice again, um, I could be, I'm persuaded that you were the last man that I could possibly be persuaded to marry. That's exactly the epitome of what we're what we should be doing in conflict like these two people should totally not work and yet we make them work and that's what's exciting about it um, okay I, I love conflict and thank you Sarah I, I will be seeking you <laughs> out um, <laughs> um, some of you have written more than 20 or so books. I think, yes. <laughs> In writing that many stories, um, what gives you the inspiration that makes them all distinct and different? <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do. Um, what makes them distinct? It's that process um, that I was talking about, and maybe on, on some level, it's um, a mystical process. Who knows what's going on in my brain? But the uh, the characters come. And I do get ideas for plots. I get ideas for scenes. But there's also the other thing going on, and I'm sure every other author here has, has been through this. It's, I already did that. I'm not going to do that. I already did that. Or I have an idea for a scene, and it just sounds cliched to me, and so then I go in the opposite direction. What's the last thing? that they should be doing at this moment, and that's the thing I go for. Not the thing that you would expect, but the thing that you, it wouldn't even occur to you. That's one way to keep it fresh. I think every book is individual, and you, that's how you keep it fresh, as you treat them individually, um, and, and see what the book is gonna tell you about the story as you're working on it, which may explain why I'm so slow. Um. Okay, my next question um, has to do with, tell. I want to hear more about the books or the most recent release you've had. And um, when someone asks you about that book, what is the thing that you want them to know right away? Not necessarily an elevator pitch, but this book is the one that I love because. You're la oh, I'm going to ask Tessa because she's laughing at me. Well, I think the most recent one was a self-published uh, called Follow. Why do I love that? Because the hero loves his dog. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think, you know, in my and like, I think probably. Oh Jesus, I'm totally floundering here. Uh, I think 
in all in my last like three releases, you know, uh, there was this, there was like a really serious conflict that the hero and heroine had to work through. Uh, in Follow, the, the self-published I put out recently, the heroine was uh, pretending to be uh, just a random road hookup for this guy, but she was actually there to, um, you know, spy on him for his father. Uh, and the one before that, the heroine uh, ran away from the hero and um, to go pay her father's debt, and she had to run away from him because, sorry, this book is called Too Beautiful to Break. And she had to do that because the hero has a fear of exactly what she needed to do. He has a fear, his one fear in life is the same thing that she had to go run headlong into. Um, yeah, I think, I, I, I love all, you know, every release I put out is my favorite one, so it's really hard to pick, you know, like why I, this, is, this is the one that somebody should read, but. Um, yeah, because I love them all equally, so I don't know. <laughs> it's a terrible answer. Um, I really love my book because it's finished. Can I change my answer? Um, I, I love the series because I've started out with these three awful men who've taken complete advantage of their position of power and privilege and have run amok for years and years and years. And it is such a joy to bring them together with women who are going to make them stop in their tracks. Um, and so the, the first one, A Duke in Shining Armor, I particularly love because so many people are drunk at the beginning of the book. <laughs> And because I have a hero, a heroine in this crazy wedding dress from the 1830s with big balloon sleeves and her, a headpiece that goes up to here and a big skirt who escapes by crawling out of a window while she's drunk in the rain. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say right now. But, but do you see why I love this story? Um, so uh, Tessa said uh, something about loving all of her books equally, which made me think of my children. And so I'm going to just say real quick, um, my, it's my youngest son's birthday today. So happy, happy birthday, Will. I love you. Mommy will be home tomorrow. I, I, I wanted to do that. Some of the mommy guilt can go away. <laughs> um, so my latest release is Love Will Always Remember. Um, it's about a lobbyist and a chef. Uh, it's an amnesia story, and before you guys give me those looks, this is a, this is a good, you'll, you'll love this amnesia story. And that's part of the thing that I love about it, um, is that my heroine um, loses her memory, um, and the sort of trauma that happened to her that changed who she was, she forgets that. And so for a brief period of time, she goes back to being the person that she was, who essentially is who she's meant to be. And um, once she gets her memories back, she has a second chance to decide sort of how she wants to live her life and what type of woman she wants to be and because it's a romance novel, what type of man she wants to love. Um, and just the idea that despite the things that happen to us, we have a choice in how we're going to move through this world and how we're going to let people affect us and how we're um, going to affect other people um, is just sort of powerful to me because sometimes we can feel like we don't have power, but there are things that we have control of. We have control of ourselves. Um, and I did not picture all of that when I wrote this book, um, but it's something that came to me definitely through the last stages of revision. Um, so that's what I would say to people. All right, so uh, for me, uh, Lady Be Bad, the two characters, the hero and heroine, are supposed to do, are, are thinking that they should be in the roles that they've always been predetermined in. And what I would say if someone were to say, why should you read this book, is because these people actually go beyond what is expected of them. The heroine is supposed to be dutiful and marry someone that she's supposed to marry. Fine. Because that's what Duke's daughters do. And the hero 
is always been uh, relegated to second place and is supposed to be the rake and irresponsible and whatever. And they both learn through meeting one another that they can actually reject those premises. And I, you know, spoiler alert, I have a big problem with premise rejecting in my own life. I'm like, oh, well, this is the way it should be, right? Because that's, no, I am constantly writing those premise rejectors. And I like to really explore that a lot. So I think that that's what's interesting about my books is that my heroes and heroines are, are more than they, even they think they are once they find true love. So my, um, <clears throat> my release is A Daring Arrangement, which is set in the Gilded Age New York City. And it's a fake engagement story, which was um, my wonderful editor's idea. And uh, it was a lot of fun to write, because I had never tried to write a fake engagement story and to come up with the reasons why they both agreed to the engagement was a lot of fun. But I think my favorite part of the book is that you know, I got to include so many crazy um, real life Gilded Age details in the story because they're so crazy that you cannot even make this stuff up. And uh, the story opens with um, the heroine going to meet the hero. He's having a birthday party on horseback on the top floor of a restaurant, um, which actually happened in New York City in, uh, I think it was 1903, but they had the groom, the waiters dressed as grooms, and they had um, trays on the saddles, and the saddlebags had straws, and they had a, an entire dinner party for these men on horseback. And go Google the picture, <laughs> because it is hilarious. So that is, um, that kind of stuff that, you know, I mean, you can't make that stuff up. So that for me is, is the fun in, uh, in that book. Willie, you're not having that type of birthday party. I'm sorry. <laughs> but why? Um, you know what I'm going to do now because it's getting close to 8 o'clock. I think about 15 minutes to or whatever. I can't read my watch. Um, I'm going to open it up for some questions. Um, raise your hand and we'll go with it. Thank you. But it's always amazing to me to see African-American women writing romance. I've been reading romance for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, there was always the extra layer of, not only do I read romance, but I'm reading about people that don't look like me. So how do you deal with that layer of, OK, now I'm here. I'm a person of color, and I'm writing these books. People are skeptical because of your race, but they're also skeptical because it's romance. How do you deal with that? Um, yeah, uh, I had the same experience you have. I've been reading them 33 years, I guess, um, and <laughs> not seeing anyone who looked like me, um, not reading stories where I guess they felt that women who looked like me, looked like us, deserved to be loved, deserved to be chosen. Um, so I dealt with it the only way I knew how, which was I always knew that my heroine was going to be a black woman. It didn't occur to me that I would write anything else. Um, and that probably makes it a little bit difficult for me. I have had some signings where I know that that's made it difficult for me. Um, but it's always been import important that I tell this story, that I sh write a romance um, where there's a woman of color who is chosen, who is loved, who is intelligent, who makes choices, who acts and is not acted upon. Um, and I just didn't know any other way to go. That's what I was going to do, and I just, you know, found people who were willing to go along on the ride with me. So that's what I did. I'm going to dive in. I am pre-published. I'm not published yet, but um, I've been around the industry a while, um, and I love to d dig into the industry. I would say that as recently as six to seven years ago. There was such, um, you either wrote African American romance or you weren't writing romance. Or you were writing something that people were not as interested in. That was as recently as six or seven years ago. Um, and I must admit that one of the things that I did when I first started writing is that I didn't automatically say I was going to write women of color. 
as my main characters. I just, did, well, actually, I wrote interracial or, or I wrote whatever, but I, it wasn't a point where I said, I want to write romances or stories about people or women of color. And then this market is in constant flux and in a positive way. It has a lot more it needs to do, but at the same time, it has opened itself up in a very positive way so that you're in a room that is a room of people of different colors, different backgrounds, and we're talking about romance. And we're smiling and laughing together talking about romance. And I think that it's definitely something that is very exciting to me to see. And on this, and I think you'll all agree that five years ago we weren't having these kinds of discussions. These questions were not being asked. So I'm very excited. My stories, I'm all over the place. I no, but I um, I write 1920s um, historical fiction. It has a strong central romance, but it was really important for me to write about the Black Belt in Chicago during that time period. And one of the inspirations, frankly, was actually Joanna Shoup, because she made a big deal about saying, I'm stepping out and I'm writing The Gilded, Gilded Age. I'm not writing Regency. I love Regency. But she said, I'm not writing Regency. And I thought that was like, whoa, that, look at that girl. What is she up to? Um, so um, I just wanted to add that. More questions. Yes. Oh, just, just nodding at you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll name some authors for you. Um, and um, I'm going to start with Beverly Jenkins. I'm going to I'm going to mention Brenda Jackson. I'm going to mention Alyssa Rye. Alicia. Alicia Rye. I get my Alyssa's and my Alicia's messed up. But Alicia Cole, Alyssa Rye. Ray. Alicia, Alicia Rye and Alicia, Alicia, Alicia. Alicia. Alyssa, Alyssa Cole and Alicia Ray. I love it when I just yes. take to everyone down the same path. Uh, oh, yes, K.M. Jackson. Um, oh, my gosh. They're Farrah Rashad. Um, oh my God, Sonali Piper Dev. Hughley, Sonali, right. There's oh, Sonali a website, Dev. Robin called, Covington, uh, Women of Color Thank you. and Romance. Yeah, yes. um, that features them every month, yes. new releases from Women of Color. So if you, yeah. uh, YA, uh, if you read YA, Pintip Dunn um, has, has written a fabulous story about a, um, uh, she's written many fabulous stories, but one that focuses on um, a Thai girl in St. Louis. Um, and why can I remember the name of that? But okay, can I <laughs> can I throw in uh, Piper Hughley yes. and uh, Vanessa Riley? Absolutely. So, but but uh, the um, uh, website that Tracy mentioned is one you can certainly visit um, and say it again for me. It's Rebecca's website, and I can't yes, remember. Yes, Rebecca uh, Weatherspoon. W women of color in romance. Do yes. Yeah. Yes, so that's, um, yeah. and then there's just looking up the hashtag on Twitter, um, and there's a lot happening with that hashtag that will give you that information. More questions, yes. When you Get think you respect, next. you're all dealing with it with authors, but you're also all readers, and quite frankly, we all are too. And as readers, you encounter that same derision. I think my personal favorite was someone who worked with me when he found out I read romance. He looked at me dead in the eye and said, wow, I thought you were smart. Wow. So what are the potential reposts <laughs> that you think of or could make or that you've heard that we always should be thinking of when we want to raise the respect and courtesy that we know the genre deserves? Thank you. I'll, I'll dive in. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I can probably come off as kind of a, a intellectual snob sometimes it just whatever anyway so <laughs> yeah um i would say that i think that uh romance whether it's it's love for another person or a passion for finding the truth or um some sort of quest i mean that's the driving element and it's it's universal among literature you don't really care about people if they don't have something really important to do in a book, whether it's 
uh, find out the big secret that their family has been holding in literary fiction, or they have a traumatic event that they then have to recover from, or they fall in love. It's all very similar, and I feel like if you don't care and you're not invested in what the person wants to do, then you just don't care and you're going to not finish the book. And that's, that goes across all sorts of things. And I would also then say, oh yeah, well tell me what Jane Eyre is. And tell me what all of Jane Austen is. And tell me what, I mean, Samuel Richardson wrote Pamela, which I've read multiple times, all 900 pages. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> and it has, it's horrible. But you keep... <laughs> I mean, it's. I like. I like the book. I gotta say. I do. Anyway. Um, if someone says, "I thought you were smart," you just say, "You were right." <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you go. Nailed it. So anyway, so I would say that everything that that a relationship is just the same as a quest is just the same as finding out who solved the mystery. There's some sort of compelling element to finding out what happened and why. And I would point to all the things, you know, Dickens wrote romance. He wrote people that got together and also people that had horrible things happen to him, but that, you know, life happens, whatever. But they had that same thing happening. Harper. <laughs> Zero. Right. I'm really glad to report zero. Okay. I don't know if I've just gotten really lucky with my readership, but I've never had any negativity at all any, like, from uh, any of my readers about anything I've chosen to do. I had some readers where that was, uh, that was like their first, that was their first male male romance full stop, which I was kind of like, oh no, you should probably read someone else first. <laughs> and I was like frantically recommending other people. Um, but, uh, yeah, like it was their first male male, and I'm like really, you know, honored that they continue to read more afterwards. Like it really made me happy. Um, but yeah, I got no nothing. Like no, no bad emails, no bad, me you know, Facebook messages. It was all super positive, and like it was people that were like, I guess, I guess at the at the at the most, it was somebody saying like, I'm not sure about this. I feel it's like I'm a little uncomfortable. This isn't my thing. And I'd be like, I, you know, my response was to be like, that's, you know, okay, that's okay. Um, but then they chose to read it and they were really, really surprised how much they were invested in two worthy people falling in love, which is what it was. So, was I nervous about writing it? Totally, yeah. Um, but, um, well, that, I mean, I guess not so much. I, I think more from a technical standpoint, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much like it was really easy to write two people falling in love um, that like I love these characters <laughs> when it got down to the nitty gritty. I, you know, like, of course, I did. I did a lot of Googling. Uh, <laughs> but no, it was it was like a really great <laughs> a lot of YouTube tutorials. Uh, no, but like I want to write more. I will write more. I loved it. I had a great experience with it. I want to I want to do it again. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for reading it. More questions? Seriously? More questions? OK, well, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, do we have a few more minutes? Um, we do. OK, thank you, because I thought we started it in. A, OK, so what am I going to ask you ladies now? Let me think, let me think. OK. Um, Things that fascinate me about writing and authors and all that good stuff. Um, how long does it take you to write 60,000 words? Clean. <laughs> I just need to know. I'm looking, I'm starting at the end here with this one. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> it, de it depends on the book. Um, I do write fairly fast and I write fairly clean, which um, I'm thankful for because I have two small kids, and uh, my writing time is, you know, it's very, very, I have a very short window, so, um, uh, uh, and it, it just depends. I'm, I really, I'm one of those authors that I try to write a thousand words a day, full stop, no matter what, I have that, you know, every day a thousand words, and that way I find I'm, I'm just moving forward, and so, um, yeah. Yeah, what's the math? I don't know. I wasn't... 
It was my understanding there would be no math. So. Um, I think I, I aspire to be Joanna in writing a thousand words a day, but I don't. I do also write fast, but I also find my time gets sucked up by my own distraction. I'd, I'd like to, yeah, Twitter, sorry. Anyway, uh, so probably three months takes me. <clears throat> and then there's a lot of futzing. But I write also fairly clean. So. Uh, I have here everyone. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I probably shouldn't admit that. I don't know, and I don't write clean at all. I write multiple drafts. Um, I could do it like Nano, but nobody would get fed. Um, <laughs> nobody, the house would be horrible. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near me because <laughs> you wouldn't. So <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe four months. Maybe clean five something. I don't know. Yeah, about that. I'm not sure. It could take a year. Um, again, depends on the book. And I'm definitely not a clean writer. It's over and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And there's I can't even tell you how much gets deleted before I get to a point where I'm happy with what I've written. I wish I. I wish I didn't write that way. I wish I could do a thousand words a day and be very disciplined, but I'm not. And I'm also easily distracted by research, particularly. OK, don't be mad at me. <laughs> I write really fast. Um, I write 3,000 words a day. So it takes me about six weeks to eight weeks, six to eight weeks. I know. I know. I, I have an hourglass from Target that I turn over <laughs> the last half an hour, and I, I do sprints. I don't know. Uh, some, but, but like to be fair, some days I write 800 words or 400 words. It's, you know, like some days I'm just not feeling it, or I'm distracted or hungover. <laughs> it happens a lot more than you think. Uh, but yeah, I tend to, when I have like a good six hours to write, I can, I can do a lot. Yeah, so. Uh. And, and I ask this question for me. Um, because, uh, and, and also for you all, because it's really important. Sometimes you'll look at an author and it's, it's different for each author. And it's taken me a while to learn that because I, I used to hate on myself because I'm on the slow side. And, but it's always different and people's, um, definition of clean is even different. So it's a, it's a good panel here. And, and my friend is right there, Loretta and I. I'm going to go here and then to you. Go ahead. I would love to hear from each of you about your writing practice. Where do you write? Um, do you write in the morning? Do you write in the evening? Um, we heard a little bit from some of you about how much time you spend to stay away. But I'd love to hear about what your respective writing practice. Oh okay, yeah, start. I um, I, if I don't start like first thing in the morning, the second my child goes out the door for a school, I won't write for the whole day. It's weird. Like if I don't start like the second she goes out the door, I just will. I, I'll be like, oh, maybe it's a cleaning day, or maybe I'll go to the mall. Uh, so yeah, it has to be really just. It's super disciplined. I have to start right away, and um, yeah, just yeah. That's. I mean, that's just a weird quirk. I guess. It's a good thing you're so efficient. <laughs> well, it's some days, the hungover days. Yeah. <laughs> um, I used to have a pretty good schedule of writing every single day, and that went away a long time ago. Um, I try to write, have pick days now, say three or four days a week, where I don't do anything else but write. That doesn't always work out. It's life intrudes. And for some reason, it seems to be intruding more than it used to. Um, but I do have a place, and if I'm not at home and we travel, um, we create a place. So I, al I have an office. As long as I'm away for a period of time, I always have a space where I'm working, and it has to be quiet, and I have to have all my books around me or whatever. It has to be my little nest. Um, that much is consistent. If only I would walk in the door and sit down in front of the computer and start writing every single day with consistency, that would be like that would be really great. But it has not been happening. Can I also add that my husband he is a bartender at night and he's home all day, so most of it's me avoiding him. <laughs> 
I just want to make sure you understand I'm not that efficient. It's really, there's an ulterior motive. Um, I have an office in the house, um, and I do my best work in the morning. Um, after lunch, it's no good. Um, and the longer I write uh, during the day um, correlates with how close I am to a deadline. So <laughs> the closer the deadline, the more likely I am to be writing longer into the day. Um, my husband works at home as well, and so um, I love that, and I love him. But <laughs> <laughs> makes it a little difficult to get stuff done. Uh, until 2017 happened, I was okay with, with my process, which is I just would write whenever I can and I would get home from work and write for a couple hours. My kid would be um, home from high school but is a gamer, so would disappear. <laughs> Fine, whatever. Um, and that used to be that used to work for me, but this year has been such a dumpster fire in terms of my attention span. And I, it's something that I've talked about with uh, many authors and my editor. And uh, so I need to rethink my process. Right now, I'm writing whenever I can, but I need to actually define it more and try to realize that it's a friggin' job and that I need to do it. And it wasn't just like fun escape time because I'm finding it more difficult to escape. But I tend to write. I write at the end of my couch. I don't really, I can really write anywhere. Um, I just need to be in the frame of mind where I can escape into it. And I haven't actually had that all this year because, you know, stupid fucking, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I have a day job, so I come home at like two and then my kids get home about the same time, and so I'm throwing chicken nuggets and bagel bites at them and like <laughs> running as fast as I can from my office where I can just lock myself in. And that's generally like that after school time where they're decompressing, chilling, you know, snacking and doing homework is when I'm off writing. And noise canceling headphones, I cannot recommend enough if you are an author. Yeah, well, or a husband you're trying to avoid. <laughs> the lady right behind you and then I'll come to you. Yeah. What are you all working on now? <laughs> right now, uh, okay, so I just finished the last book in the Academy series, uh, which is called Disturbing His Peace. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'm working on like a first co-written book right now uh, with an author named Eve Dangerfield. Oh, we got some fans. <laughs> uh, she's in Australia, so we, we have no idea what the other's time zone is, so we just <laughs> mail off our chapter and then we hear back from her when we hear back. Um, but yeah, I'm doing my first co-writing experience, which is really turning out to be fun. I'm uh, working on the second book in the uh, Difficult Dukes series. Um, and have decided that this book will probably be the, um, the groom who was left standing at the altar in the first book, because I, I'm not sure I can resist him. He <laughs> has so many problems that have to be <laughs> increased. Um, I'm starting a new series. Um, I have, um, personally, I have four friends that I've known from college, and every year since we've graduated from college, we've gone away together um, for a week um, for a vacation. And it's gone from a week to like a long weekend, and we have kids, but we've done it every year, so for past 20-something years. Um, and so my new series is kind of inspired by that experience. I'm writing a book that's called The Lady is Daring. It's the uh, third book in the Duke's Daughter series. It's actually, it's based on Mary Bennett. So it's, you know, you want the miserable, sullen pedant to be a heroine. <laughs> you know, as you do. Uh, so I'm working on that and revising it and trying to, to give Mary finally a happy ever after, because she really deserves it. She needed to play the piano and have people say yay. So, yeah. Um, 
the second book in the 400 series, I just did the page proofs, that's done. It's called A Scandalous Deal, and that's at, out at the end of April. And I'm uh, wrapping up the first draft on the third book of the series, which is called an, A Notorious Vow, which features a deaf hero, um, which is kind of interesting because at the Gilded Age, we see all sort of the you know sign language, American Sign Language really forms and becomes the norm, and we see the, the hearing aids and all that stuff come into play. So it's, um, it's a fascinating thing for me to research. This is the last question right here. You're the one. Um, so I've, I've talk, when I talk to guys about romance novels, their criticism is that either it's objectifying or it requires the male heroes to change to be worthy of the relationship. What would be your rebuttals to that? That it's yeah, they just talk about They read every book. <laughs> <laughs> right? I oh, feel so bad. <laughs> Well, yeah, I was going to say, well, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> they have to change. Yeah, good. <laughs> I think it's important to remember that, you know, in romance, each character has their own arc and that they both, you know, it's about two people change. It's not always just him, even though we like that the best. But, um, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's two people. It, each character has their own arc say actually right every book has that every character has to change except for books like um, I, and I always forget what they're called I always mix them up with picaresque but um, Don Quixote and Tom Jones neither of the characters change from the beginning of the book to the end and that's a certain type of novel and maybe one of you guys know what that's called I don't remember but usually the character has to change and go through some sort of epiphany to be worthy of whatever is at the, or not worthy, or get killed, or whatever, at the end of their book, there's, it's very rare for characters not to change, because then you don't really care. You're just seeing the same person from beginning to end. What's the fun of that? Unless it's Don Quixote tilting at windmills, and that's his, <laughs> that's his deal, so. Well, uh, I'm going to bring back our representative from the Strand Bookstore, but I'd like to say uh, thank you all for coming. This has been a fabulous <laughs> group. Fabulous authors. Thank you.